I have been bitten by snakes probably more than anyone in human history. We would have litters born of 30, 40 baby snakes and of different species. And what I realized, these baby snakes almost from birth behaved very differently from each other. Some of them were nasty and some of them were nice. Some of them I would stick my finger in front of them and they would try and rip my finger off. And others were just so sweet and you could pet them on the nose and they would in their own way like it. So I would call that personality. Hi, I'm Jay Ingram. Welcome to Anthropomania, the podcast that untangles our complex, irrational, all too human relationship with wildlife. Everything from rats to ragweed. We despise them, we treasure them, we domesticate them, we protect them, we kill them, we eat them. Sometimes we destroy their habitat and then we create a new one for them. All of this is remaking the living world in our own image. With anthropomania, we try to make sense of all of that. Now, you know the term anthropomorphism, the habit of attributing human qualities to other species. Think of anthropomania as the super extreme of that. I guarantee there'll be moments in this series where you won't be able to stop yourself from laughing at the ridiculous lengths people go to make wildlife human. But it's serious too. We have a history of refusing to believe that other animals are capable of the kinds of things that we do. Eliminating that bias to allow ourselves to see other animals as they really are requires us to admit they're more like us than we used to think, or even that we like to think. On the other hand, going overboard on their humanness may give us an unrealistic picture of what they really are. We hope that as you listen, you may start to question some of your own assumptions about the nature of wildlife. Now, I'm not doing this alone. I couldn't. There are three of us anthropomaniacs. Hi, I'm Nikki Wilson. And I'm Erica Siren. Hey, guys. This episode focuses on animal personality. Now, this is a tricky subject because at first hearing, it already sounds like we've taken a significant human quality and dumped it onto animals. But animal personality in the scientific community, it's a big deal. I actually think it's kind of a big deal everywhere, and we might just do it a bit unwittingly. For example, my dear cat, Oscar, who lived with me for 20 years, just passed away at Christmas. And the number one thing I heard from people was, I'm so sorry, man, that cat had a lot of personality. And I think it sort of refers to his cantankerous streak or maybe his food lust. Um, But it is the thing they said. It's the word they used. You know, uh, sorry to hear about Oscar, Nikki, but uh, it almost sounds like they thought it was a kind of quantity. You know, you have more personality or you have less personality, which I'm not sure is really what it's all about. Yes. Or that personality is, you know, somehow attributed to certain traits. Oscar was very snuggly until he wasn't. And so, you know, if someone was cleaning his litter box who wasn't one of us, for example, if they were house sitting, uh, he might attack their legs. Um, (laughs) And we also had child locks on every cupboard in our kitchen for his entire life because he ate everything from dried apricots to latex. That is personality. (laughs) That is certainly personality. I'm beginning to wonder that what people think personality is may not be what scientists think it is. I think people's notions of how animal personality are linked to ours is a real area of interest because I found this animal personality test online called the Animal in You, and millions of people have taken it, like including celebrities like Dr. Phil and his wife. And it assigns an animal to you, and that animal sort of embodies these personality traits. I sent you guys the link. I want you to take it. I've done it, and I'm just going to say it called me lazy and not happy about it. Although I am a good swimmer. They got that right. We're going to talk about this later, but just make sure you do it before the end of the show. Definitely. I love this stuff. Now, the voice you heard at the very top of the show talking about the personalities of snakes, that was Hal Herzog. I am Hal Herzog. I am a professor emeritus in psychology at Western Carolina University. And I study the uh, complicated and interesting relationships that people have with other species. Complicated is the right word. Hal is the guy when it comes to studying animal personality. 
Back in the 1980s, so-called real scientists would actually laugh you out of the room at the mere suggestion that an animal had a personality. The implication was only humans are complex and unique enough for that. But Hal wasn't willing to close the book on that idea. Dr. Herzog, you had an experience uh, in the mid-80s working with snakes that actually got you started thinking about personality. So what sort of tests did you use to deduce personality? Yeah, I was working in a lab in which we looked at the behavior of snakes. And the great thing about snakes is that they're very precocial, which means that they can do adult things from a very early age, including eat and defend themselves against predators and things like that. And I was very fortunate because snakes have lots of babies. The snakes we looked at, garter snakes, and we would have litters born of 30, 40 baby snakes and of different species. And I developed the snake personality test. And what I would do is I had a standardized trial and I would put my finger into their cage and I would leave my finger immobile for about 30 seconds. I would start wiggling it for about 30 seconds. And then for a minute, I would harass the snake in a more overt way. And I would count the number of times that it would try to bite my finger. Some of those snakes, the really mean snakes, the Mexican garter snakes, would attack my finger sometimes 60 times in one minute. With no permanent scars. With no permanent scars. So that description of personality, let's say aggressive versus non-aggressive, uh, seems very straightforward uh, to me. But I think most of us who aren't working in that area scientifically think of personality as being a very deep complicated thing that humans have and maybe great apes. But is that, to you, is that a, a good word to describe even a garter snake's behavior? I would not say it describes their behavior, just I wouldn't say that personality describes a person's behavior. What it describes is differences in behavior. And from a psychological point of view, that's what personality is. So I behave differently when I'm teaching is when I'm talking with you or talking to my wife or my kids. But there's a commonality in my behavior. I have certain traits. Psychologists basically have determined that there's five of these traits. And what my little snake personality test did, in my view, was measure only one of those five traits. And I'm sure that snakes had other traits as well, but I could only measure one. And the one that I measured with my little personality test was uh, one on these uh, big five traits called agreeableness versus disagreeableness. So I was I just like you, you could have a test for introversion and extroversion and just measure one trait of personality. I was just measuring one trait of personality in these baby snakes. Did you call it personality in those days, 1980s? To my friends, yeah. <laughs> to my wife, yeah. To myself, yeah. Did I write it down in scientific journals and publications? No. To my everlasting shame, the idea that animals had personalities at that time would have been a quite a radical idea. And even though that I knew that I was studying personality in snakes, I did not have the moral fortitude to announce that in uh, scientific journals where my papers would have to go through peer review. Now, I would have no hesitation with calling those studies of personality. But one of the things it's done is that it has created a whole new field of work, which is emphasizing individual differences. And so we find these individual differences in all the way from octopuses to, to dogs to people. And one reason is, I think, the fact that we have brought pets, particularly dogs, into our lives. Dogs are what have been called an ambassador species that when you bring a, a pet into your life and you live with it and you get to know it and you get to know that it has a personality, you think of it differently. So our um, attitudes, uh, behaviors, relationships with the animals in our lives are anything but straightforward? When we look at our relationships with other species, what we see is this complicated mire involving language, it involves intuition, it involves instinct, it involves a culture. And what we have is a situation where our judgments about the use of animals is oftentimes flagrantly inconsistent. So let me give a good example. Studies show that if you ask Americans, and I suspect this is also true of Canadians, do you think animals should have the same right to live as people? 
in the United States, some studies have shown that 60% of people will say yes to that. Yes. They look you in the face and say, I think that animals should have the same right to life as a person. Yet in the United States, close to 80% of people believe that we have the right to hunt animals and 95% of people eat animals. So at the same time, we love animals. We think they should have the same rights as people, but yet we hunt them and we eat them. Now, those things cannot go together in any philosophically co coherent system. And what, I, what I've learned in 30 years of studying our relationships with animals is this example isn't the exception, it's the rule. So can I just say, I think Hal must have a pretty interesting personality if he is willing to be bit by a snake 60 times. So thanks for taking one for the science team, Hal. And I also just find it so interesting that he has decoupled personality um, defined as a set of behaviors from any kind of moral standing. Yeah, I think that's interesting too. And it it does say to me a little bit that maybe personality isn't this all-encompassing quality that I think a lot of us think it is. The other thing that struck me was that he was hesitant, unwilling, in fact, to uh, use the word personality in the mid-80s in the scientific literature when clearly he knew what he was dealing with. And, you know, if I could just briefly refer to Jane Goodall, she was a person who in the late 60s was attributing personality to chimps. I got a copy of her book from 1971, In the Shadow of Man. And here's what she said when she first started studying them. Uh, as soon as I was sure of knowing a chimpanzee, if I saw it again, I named it. Some scientists feel that animals should be labeled by numbers, that to name them is anthropomorphic. But I've always been interested in the differences between individuals. And a name is not only more individual than a number, but it's also far easier to remember. So she was basically saying in 1971 that some of the same things that Hal was saying today. Right. And it's interesting that this observation has been brought up time and again since the 1970s, but it's almost there was this fear that assessing someone's personality or an animal's personality in some way makes them a person which is obviously not the case. So I'm not sure if you guys actually know the backstory of anthropomorphism and its kind of ugly stepsister reputation in the science community. It seems like anthropomorphism has long dogged the field of animal personality, especially because it didn't really jump off until the early 2000s, despite this really rich history of humans not only studying, but living among animals and, and seeing that not all horses are equal in terms of their personality traits. Not all fish are equal in terms of their personality traits. Uh, and so we see this with Goodall in the 1970s, looking at these cheerful chimpanzees. Herzog brings it up in the 1980s with these precocious snakes. And even in the 1990s, there's a great study on shy sunfish and how they adapt to different environments. The tipping point actually came in the early 2000s. Sam Gosling was a psychology student at UC Berkeley, and he wanted to study animal personality, kind of picking up where Hal Herzog had left off. Yeah, I was originally interested in understanding animal personality as a means just for understanding personality. And if you think about it, much of psychology is based on animal work. Think of Pavlov's dogs and Skinner's pigeons and all the perception work. And there's, you know, there's so much work where psychology has benefited from animals. Why not personality too? Sam was a key figure in legitimizing the study of animal personality, but it wasn't exactly easy. In fact, when he told his anthropology professor of his plans, she threw him out of her office. And she yelled at me and I had to back my way out of the office and, and never to return again because she was so concerned about these accusations of anthropomorphism. You know, people in that camp thought, why would you study this? Because obviously animals don't have personality. And then in the other camp, there were people who knew animals and worked with animals, people who had pets and worked in farms or had grown up on a farm or something like that. And anyone who had met animals said, well, of course, animals have personality. Why would you even study it? At the same time that Sam was digging into animal personality from a psychology point of view, just up the road and unbeknownst to Sam were two biologists, 
Andy Shi and Allison Bell, who are also tiptoeing into this area, but this time from a behavioral ecology point of view. The breakthrough moment for me was realizing that I was studying two different populations of stickleback. Allison has spent her entire scientific life studying the three spine stickleback, which is a teeny tiny little fish that you think wouldn't have any personality whatsoever. So in one of the populations, in the Navarro River population, individuals behaved consistently. So you could measure the same individual more than once and you could see that, oh, look, they have this behavioral type. So that suggested that there was this, this good evidence for personality in one of these populations. In the other population, that was not the case. So in the other population, individuals didn't behave consistently. And kind of aha moment for me was realizing that this very attribute that we're interested in about like consistent individual variation that's predictable through time can itself evolve. So in one population, you, you could think of this as being like personality evolved, but in another population, it hadn't. Which brings us to today, where it's a little less likely that you'll get thrown out of your prof's office for being accused of the sin of anthropomorphism. You know, it's my impression, and Erica, you you might correct me on this, but I think there's still a lot of controversy among scientists about whether labeling behaviors uh, with the word personality is actually helpful or not. But I also think that, oddly enough, this is a situation where using a term that people are familiar with has actually confused non-scientists more than it's illuminated things for them. And I want to go back to um, Nikki's cat, Oscar. When people say he had a great personality, that to me summarizes what people think of personality. It's the guy at the party that makes the party go, you know, or it's the, it's the gloomy person who sits in the corner of the room. We think of personality as a kind of global description. And when the, then when it comes to uh, sunfish, we don't think of them that way. It's also controversial to the scientists. Have you seen any of that, Erica? Yeah, it's interesting. The controversy isn't necessarily in the validity in studying personality, but what to actually call it. You know, I was speaking to Sam Gosling, and he said when people first described these sets of personality traits as personality, it was referred to as the dreaded P. And because people feared the word personality so much— there was this jingle jangle of different definitions in ecology that included temperament, behavioral syndromes. So still very much dancing around that dreaded P personality definition. I'd like to know why. I mean, what's the big deal? So, you know, so your cat shares your personality traits um, or, you know, you, I don't know, remember things the same way an elephant does. I mean, what's the big deal? What's so threatening to us? I don't know if it's threatening so much as inaccurate or Im imprecise. Imprecise is a better word. Um, because as I understand it, some of the value in this is that the tradition was, uh, setting aside the fear of anthropomorphism for a sec, the disadvantage of not doing it was you'd look at a species and you'd say, well, as a species, this is how they behave. This species behaves. And there and people were looking at individual differences, which as Hal said, that's what animal personality is all about. And they were saying, well, they're just like deviations from the average and we don't care about those. This is how this species behaves. The biologists at the same time were recognizing that, hey, those individual differences are actually crucial to that species. So is the study of animal behavior the same as the study of animal personality? Yeah, as long as, well, hey, you can jump in, Erica. I'm not the expert on this. Um, as long as you acknowledge that the behavior of one animal, let's say one coyote, can be quite different from the behavior of another coyote. And you can't just say coyotes are this. You can say, even in this pack, there are coyotes that behave differently, and we're going to call that personality, just like, you know, on a hockey team, there are people with different personalities. Not all behavior is personality, but personality can certainly be a driver of behavior. And I think that's another reason why it was so important for this to become an established part of behavioral research, because if you ignore an important aspect of what drives someone's behavior, that's not good science. And 
that's not going to push us forward in understanding animals and even understanding ourselves. Well, and I would just jump in and say here that here in Jasper National Park at the Human Wildlife Conflict Office, there's this bulletin board and it's got pictures of all sorts of bears, mostly bears, uh, but also, you know, bull elk with huge racks. And it's a place to keep track of the animal personalities that move around us in the park. And they use those personality traits to help assess the risk of those animals to the public. So these are things that are happening all over where wildlife is managed. They get to know individuals. The ones that are less aggressive get a pass. The ones that are more aggressive get different management treatment. Whether or not there's consensus higher up, I think there's just a traditional or local knowledge happening on the ground where it's being used all the time. Yeah, that kind of goes back to what Jane was saying, right? The easiest way to keep track of an animal isn't to give them a number, but give them a name. Give them something that you can recognize them with. And it's much easier for not only yourself, but the animal as well. You know, uh, Erica, there's a bull elk and his name is Randy. He's a prolific breeder. Is Randy Randy? He was, but not super aggressive to people. But man, he dominated the rut. Oh, dominating the rut. Uh, That's a personality uh, (laughs) attribute for sure. The thing is, though, I don't see why you need to use the word personality. Like in that in that board that you're describing, Nikki, you say, uh, ra- give him a name. I don't care. That isn't a personality. That's just a name. It could be a number. Randy is aggressive, but not too aggressive. Uh, but during the rut, you got to stay clear of him. So to me, uh, it the word is contentious. And yet the word, I don't, I just, my question is, what is it adding? to the scientific understanding. I think, once again, it's all about making things easier. So when the field of animal personality was being established, they were using all of these different terms. And it's kind of like all of these scientists were sitting on individual islands looking for another scientist that was saying the same thing as them. But since they weren't speaking the same language, they weren't able to communicate with each other and make something substantial. So personality... Love it or hate it, it kind of just stuck. I, I'd like to throw in something uh, completely off the wall. And that is the idea of how permanent personality is. Now, in humans, the studies have shown pretty much that unless um, something really dramatic happens to you, your personality type is consistent over you know the periods of time that have been measured, pretty consistent throughout that time. But in the animal world, and maybe in the human world, there are parasites that change animals' personalities. So rabies is an obvious example. An animal infected by that virus becomes super aggressive when it might and probably wasn't super aggressive before. But the most interesting parasite is toxoplasma. It infects cats, but really interestingly, en route to infecting a cat, it usually gets picked up by a a mouse. And then to get into the cat, it would help if the cat ate the mouse. But mice and rats stay away from cats until they're infected with toxoplasma. And then they're attracted to cat urine, which pretty much seals their doom. Here's the curious and interesting thing. So the the rat or the mouse's personality changed to become less fearful, more agreeable, more approachable, uh, fatally. Uh, But Humans are infected with toxoplasma too, especially humans who own cats. One study in France showed that 80% of the French population was infected. And what people have been searching for, and I would say not convincingly found yet, was that are there human personality differences that are the result of being infected by toxoplasma? And I'll tell you, there's some pretty funny data. I wouldn't say it was uh, absolutely solid, but more people get into car accidents if they're infected with toxoplasma, meaning that they're slightly more aggressive. Um, More people go into business courses in universities than others if they're infected with toxoplasma. So there's this just generally interesting thing that parasites can change personality. Yeah. And I think that's almost the future of the study of animal personality. Personality is defined as the consistency of behavior across different environments until it isn't. How does age change that? How do parasites change that? And how does mental illness change that? How does mental illness change that? How do drugs that treat mental illness change that? These are really important research questions, but 
Still, this research is being done by scientists. Scientists live 80 years max. And so to understand the boundaries of personality over time in different situations, you can't just limit your study to humans. You have to try to find these answers in animal models that don't live 80 years. And that's exactly what people like Alice and Bell are doing. They're looking at how personality changes over time, not in humans, but in tiny little guppies that live maybe a month at most. But in that lifetime, their personalities do change for a number of different reasons. So maybe that's that's where it's most useful. Not that call, giving animals personalities, you know, is a global kind of assessment of them as individuals, but it's just a tool to identify specific behaviors and how they contribute overall to the welfare of that animal. Exactly. That's what behavioral ecology and animal personality is all about. It's just a tool to better understand things. And you know what doesn't influence the way that tool works whatsoever? Anthropomorphism. We can care until the cows come home about whether or not a personality is better than another personality. But the personality, as measured by that tool, it stays the same, whether we think highly of it or not. You know, this idea of calling any differences in behavior among individuals in a group personality seems to me it means that just about any living thing can have a personality, even insects like ants that explore have a different personality than ants that stay at home. And I think that's a really different notion of personality than most of us have. Yeah. You know what? I have a great story about that. And it has to do with spiders, aggression, And sexual cannibalism. Anyone interested in that? (laughs) Yes. So this is a great example of how a personality can be good until it isn't, right? So in the study on female fishing spiders, they found that the super aggressive females were at a great benefit when resources were low. So the aggressive ones were really good at getting food, stealing food from others. Life was good. However, That became a detriment when it came to mating season because these aggressive females who were very good at killing became so good at killing that they started killing their potential mates. And as a result, these aggressive females weren't able to produce any offspring. And that led to kind of the extinction almost of that personality trait, at least in that situation. They were well fed, though. I think that's a really interesting example and and sort of extreme, but it makes me wonder, I mean, is having a diversity of personalities advantageous so that a species can handle changes that come in their environment or, you know, one year there's a plague or it's too dry or the next year it's too wet, stuff like that. Climate change is a good example. Yeah. And that's kind of what sustained the variation of personality, right? If one personality was better than the other, eventually every single species would have that personality. But the point is, is that a personality is consistent and the environment isn't. So regardless of what a personality is, it's going to be a good in one situation and not so good in another. And that kind of enables the diversity to persevere across many, many generations. Okay, so now we've been talking about pets. I think it's time to reveal uh, what animal personalities we all have, each of us individually, on the test that we just did. So, Nikki, you did the test first, and you've even you even hinted at a couple of your characteristics, that you're a good swimmer and you're lazy. I kind of think manatee when... Yeah. And, you know, uh, I read a great line the other, I read a great line the other, yeah, saying that, no, no, wait, saying that the manatee's closest relative in nature is the sofa. Okay. Okay, Jay. I thought we were friends. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you, I'm an otter. Um, So some of the things are like really physically based, like they say you're cute, small, petite, like whatever. That really doesn't have anything to do with personality as far as I'm concerned. But they do say that I have a lot of energy and positivity, but then I have trouble getting stuff done. And they're like, I don't want to call you lazy, but you get kind of distracted. You really need someone to put that bone in front of you. So you chase it. And I was like, really? 
Ask my family about that. Ask them how ask them how they have to rip my laptop out of my hands. Anyway, Erica, what were you? I want to know. Did they get it right? Okay, so I did this personality test. I took it very seriously. As you should. As I should. This is important. Um, and I, everyone, you're looking at a prairie dog. <laughs> Tell us more. Tell us more. Which basically means, yeah, which basically means I'm friggin' adorable. You are. But I'm a very nervous person that doesn't like to leave home. So um, once I get the vaccine for COVID-19, I'm going to do this test again. And uh, we'll see if I spread my wings and turn into a heron or something. (laughs) Well, Prairie Dog, you got to stay away from me because I'm a fox. Tell us more. And, you know... I, other than the fact that I'm not a redhead, I'm an Arctic fox, actually, white hair. And uh, boy, everything else, you know, smart, clever, industrious. I don't know. I didn't actually expect to come out with an animal quite so cool, but there you are. We're going to get some radios, Jay, and your call sign's just going to be Silver Fox. And what am I, Prairie Dog? <laughs> your nervous Prairie Dog. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> And I'll be distracted, Otter. We need better handles, Erica. Those suck. (laughs) I know, I know. I'm going to take a long walk and and think about my choices in life. So apparently when you get a prairie dog and an otter and a fox together, you come up with a podcast called Anthropomania. So thanks, guys. And thank all of you for listening today to Anthropomania. You can find the animal personality test we took and links to more information on animal personality in our show notes. Our next episode, we're going to talk about zoos, but not just ordinary zoos, the private zoos of the rich, powerful, and famous, like Pablo Escobar, Michael Jackson, and the Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google, or your favorite listening app, If you like what you hear, let us know via a five-star review. You can sign up to get our newsletter at anthropomania.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Send us ideas, suggestions for anything you'd like to hear about on Anthropomania. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, guys. That was really fun. I'm going to jump back into my prairie dog hole and I'll reemerge for the next episode. Yeah, sending you a high five from my flipper there, Erica. Yeah, that was really fun. That was really fun. <laughs>